It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the factors influencing PC monitor viewing comfort. Um, it's not really usual for me to do a video article like this. Most of my articles are in written form and have lots of facts and figures. Uh, this is more of a sort of impromptu YouTube video which I've decided to do because I was looking back at some information I used to have on my website. Um, not, not all of you will be aware, but I used to have a forum running on my website and a lot of the information there um, I was ending up sort of repeating myself over and over again and a lot of the information was found elsewhere on the website anyway. But there was some information on the forum which I found particularly useful um, and I know that it was one of the more popular topics. In fact there are multiple topics on this in this area um, and that was viewing comfort, um, eye strain and sort of what you should look for in a monitor when it comes to maximizing viewing comfort. Um, it's, I should say it's not an exact science, everybody's eyes are different and some users will find particularly, uh, particular aspects of a monitor very uncomfortable. Other users will be far more tolerant of those aspects. So really individual sensitivity does vary and you'll find that a lot when it comes to monitors. There are some things that just really bother some users and other users just couldn't care less about. So this monitor I'm using at the moment, um, it's actually quite a, a timely um, review that I'm doing on this one because I think this is a very good example of a monitor which ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to um, being good for, for viewing comfort. It is a BenQ EW277HDR. I'm not saying this is the best monitor for viewing comfort, uh, but certainly as I'll go through these factors, you'll see how they apply to this monitor and some that don't apply to this monitor. The first aspect to consider is brightness. Um, this is really of pivotal importance when it comes to monitor viewing comfort. And the brightness that you'll pick on your monitor depends on your individual sensitivity. Your eyes will have certain sensitivity to brightness and that varies between individuals. It also depends on your ambient lighting conditions, so you need to set the brightness to a level that's appropriate for the content you're viewing and also your room lighting conditions. So I'm in a, quite a bright room at the moment, um, it's sort of daylight and I've got you know some control over the my ambient lighting so it's not super bright but it's, uh, it's a nice sort of comfortable daytime brightness for me. And I set this monitor to 160 candle hours per meter squared. Now what that means is um, it's moderately bright um, but th this, this monitor actually goes up to 400 candle hours per meter squared so that means if you set the monitor to 100% brightness, this particular monitor, um, and, and also have the HDR function uh, enabled, you can read about that in the review, but um, Basically, there's a lot of headroom above what I have the brightness set to on this monitor. It can go a lot brighter. Um, some users would find 160 too bright, others would find it too dim in this kind of lighting. But generally, the sort of target you'll be going for really depends on your the lighting conditions in your room. And if it's a fairly dim room, I would tend to sort of stay close to 100 candle hours per meter squared. If there's a little bit of brightness, but it's still pretty dim, 120, maybe a bit higher. Um, but again, really, it just, it, there are no hard and fast rules. It really comes down to personal preferences. Some users would prefer much higher brightness than I've got this monitor set to. Others, much lower brightness. Um, and I wouldn't obsess too much about the, the figures for that reason. And unless you've got a colorimeter or another similar device, uh, a light meter of some sort, you won't actually know what uh, exact brightness you've got your monitor set to. And they are all different. So just because this monitor is set to 42 and gets around 160 candles per meter squared, um, for some monitors you'd have to have the brightness much higher and some lower for this particular brightness to be achieved. So really it's all about what's comfortable to you and what makes sense in your viewing conditions. And I know some users are particularly sensitive to brightness and they would actually find 160 candles per meter squared obnoxiously bright even in a brighter room than this. 
and particularly if they're viewing in the evening, their eyes are a bit tired, they would reduce the brightness much more than that, um, and even below sort of 100 candles per meter squared. And those users would have to consider the lowest uh, luminance, the, the lowest white luminance that monitors can output. This is something that I look at in reviews. Um, other reputable reviewers, TFT Central for example, they will look at this as well. And you really have to consider the lowest brightness that you can achieve on a monitor without it losing contrast. So this model, um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I think it goes down to about 40 candles per meter squared. That's way dimmer than I'd want, and it um, it's really quite a fairly low luminance, which many users would find comfortable, even if they're pretty sensitive to brightness. But there are some users who even that is too bright for them. They, sometimes they have a certain eye condition or, or other things. So just be aware that it's a very individual thing when it comes to brightness. next factor to consider is screen surface. Now it's sort of commonly accepted wisdom that a glossy screen surface gives you reflections and that's bad. You want a really strong matte anti-glare screen surface so you don't get many reflections. But it's actually a lot more complex than that. We've got a, an article on our website called Matte vs Glossy or Matte vs Glossy Monitors and this looks at not just matte and glossy as two extremes but actually a spectrum of matte and glossy. Many screens have a matte anti-glare screen surface these days, um, but they're not all the same. Um, they have what's called a haze value, and that describes how good they are at diffusing light. And that means a high haze value generally um, gives you a stronger diffusion of light, and it's more effective at handling glare, whereas lower haze value, not so effective at handling glare, um, but it can give you a cleaner image. The, the extreme of that, glossy, um, again there are different anti-reflective surfaces, glossy isn't just one thing, there are, there are different treatments that are available to help cut down on reflections, but um, some users will actually find glossy screen surfaces preferable to any matte screen surfaces just because of the, the clarity and the fact that it's sort of a very direct view of the image, um, whereas other users would find the reflections annoying and would find some degree of matte anti-glare screen surface to be preferable to, to most glossy surfaces. This monitor I'm using at the moment, the BenQ EW277HDR, uses a very light matte anti-glare screen surface. Some users would describe that as semi-glossy and there's a little bit in this article about um, what this means. But essentially, if I turn the monitor off, you'll be able to see this more clearly. You can see it doesn't have sharp reflections like a glossy screen, um, but there are. This is a fairly bright room, and you can see um, sort of my reflection, and also sort of a blurred view of the room around me. And you can see some patches of glare from light. If this was a stronger matte anti-glare screen surface, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you can just bombard it with as much light as you want, because it will diffuse that light and that starts flooding the image. So um, obviously there's no image at the moment, but I don't tend to just stare at a black screen with the monitor switched off. Um, with the monitor switched on, light from the monitor starts competing with the image and that's good, but you have to be aware that even if you've got a very effective matte anti-glare screen surface um, and light is striking the screen, you'll get a sort of a diffusion and that floods the image and it basically com that light competes with the image, you, re you reduce the perceived contrast and that is not good for viewing comfort. Um, so another aspect of a strong matte anti-glare screen surface which isn't good for viewing comfort is the fact that they often have a very grainy look. The screen surface itself um, can be, the surface layer can have a really rough texture and often with the high haze value screens in particular it has quite a thick looking coating uh, surface sorry so it actually looks like you're staring through the outer surface of the screen and looking at the image through a sort of a dirty window and some people find that very uncomfortable i find it very uncomfortable um but some users even worse than me they really just they can't abide it at all so for them they would have to pick a lower uh, haze value screen like this even if you do get slightly worse handling of glare um, 
And I should mention, I don't find the glare handling problematic at all on this monitor. It is exaggerated by the video, um, and it's really not a problem for me. I can quite happily use glossy screens, and to some users, um, glossy screens are actually preferable to even light matte anti-glare screen surfaces, just because of the absolute clarity and the vibrancy. Um, but in, in terms of viewing comfort, they just find it more comfortable because the image is, has a very, the light from the screen has a very direct emission and it's um, just something they find comfortable. So really, again, it comes down to personal preferences and your ambient lighting conditions as well. The next factor to consider is panel type. And yes, there is an article on our website all about panel types, but um, if you're not familiar at all with the diff the main LCD panel types, definitely take a look at this article. And I should mention, I will be linking to this article and all the other articles and various other things I mention in this video. Um, it will be linked to in the description of the video as well. But in terms of viewing comfort, this article doesn't really, it doesn't really look at things from that perspective. And again, that's partly because it's a very personal thing. Um, but for the purposes of this video, there are sort of three main LCD panel classes or types. IPS, TN and VA. Now IPS um, in plane switching or IPS type because there are relatively uh, similar technologies. Um, I'm not going to get into them right now because it'll cause a little bit of confusion. It's not entirely relevant, but basically IPS type, uh, TN, twisted pneumatic and VA vertical alignment. Now IPS and TN they're generally considered pretty comfortable. Some users would find one slightly more comfortable than the other, but it's not really very easy to say that specifically down to the panel type. There can be other intricacies and usually IPS panels um, are quite different to the TN panels that that user will have had experience with. So it's very difficult to say that it has anything to do specifically with the panel type, whether they prefer one or the other. VA, however, um, it's a little bit of an oddball because uh, in some ways it's actually very good for viewing comfort. Some users really like it. Um, this is a VA panel. This BenQ I'm using at the moment has a VA panel. It has a really strong static contrast ratio of around three and a half thousand to one. Um, and that's without any HDR feature active, incidentally. So what that means is that text has quite an inky look to it. Um, and just basically different elements of the image stand out really nicely, the darker and lighter elements combined. Um, there's sort of a great, a good definition. And to some users, that's very comfortable and, and quite a natural sort of viewing experience. On the flip side, because of how pixels are oriented in VA panels, some shades actually um, are very slightly closer to the viewer than other shades. Now that sounds quite bizarre, um, but some shades will actually appear slightly further away and some slightly closer, and it is very slight. It's really subtle. Most users don't even notice this, um, or probably even if they've got a VA panel think I'm talking complete nonsense. Um, but it, it's something that some people might call a slight 3D effect on VA models and there's quite a bit of discussion on that on my forum and some users definitely do notice this. It generally isn't something that people notice or find uncomfortable but some users do claim to find it slightly uncomfortable so there is that to consider but generally speaking I'd consider VA panels to be quite comfortable. As I, I talked earlier about contrast um, that is actually slightly a, a double-edged sword as well because most users find strong contrast nice. It looks natural, things look nice and inky. That's good for viewing comfort for them. But high contrast also means that the eyes are spending more time accommodating to changes of light um, on the monitor. Um, so the, light, the, the dark is um, relatively dark compared to the, the light shades and more so than on a monitor with lower contrast. So there's a, basically a greater extreme between bright and dark content. So the eyes will always be accommodating to those changes in light. And that's actually the premise of um, Samsung's eye saver mode on some of their modern monitors. 
it's part of what that does. It actually purposefully reduces the contrast to very low levels so that the eye spends less time accommodating to changes in light. But I really have to stress that for most users this really isn't a factor. And again, ambient lighting actually has more of an influence. And most users, and that includes me, they won't be strictly controlling their lighting so much that it sort of doesn't change at all. So even if you've got your very low contrast on your monitor um, and your eyes aren't accommodating to changes from the, the light from the monitor, it, they may well be adjusting to slight changes in your ambient bright, uh, brightness as well. So, you know, it's not, again, it's not a definite thing, but some users do find very low contrasts um, just more comfortable. Um, but again, that's a sort of a slim portion of users. And I would say, in general, VA panels, users find them very good for viewing comfort. The next, um, oh sorry, I'll change my desktop background, some nice meerkats, because that uh, chameleon was getting a bit boring. The next aspect is pixel density. This is a full HD monitor, 1920 by 1080 on a 27 inch screen. So by modern standards, that's a, a poor pixel density. To some users, this would be good um, because text's big, text's clear, text is easy to read. Uh, but it really depends on your viewing distance and your eyesight as to what sort of pixel density you'll find optimal. Some users actually prefer higher pixel densities. Things look clearer, sharper, potentially. Um, again, it depends on various other factors. They come into play, screen surface being one, for example. Um, panel type, sometimes uh, strange sub-pixel layouts can sort of mess things up with sharpness as well. But basically, some users actually prefer higher pixel densities. I prefer higher pixel densities, not just because it fits more on the screen at the same time, but I do like that edge and clarity, um, and I like sort of smaller, sharper looking text. But that doesn't mean that I find this uncomfortable to look at. Um, I mean, I find this perfectly comfortable. But, um, I mean, the brain is really an important part of viewing comfort as well. Physiologically, um, if users are getting annoyed by a monitor, not necessarily because it's straining their eyes directly, but because they don't like a particular aspect, that can cause discomfort eventually anyway. Um, can really start annoying them. So pixel density, again, it's a very personal thing, um, a very individual thing, but generally speaking, as high as uh, you can tolerate whilst text is still readable. And for some screens with more extreme pixel densities, for example, 4K UHD screens, 3840 by 2160 resolution, if you've got uh, quite a small screen, um, say 27 inches, 24 inches, for example, then you might actually have to use some scaling and that's that's fine or some zoom in your applications just because text depending on your viewing distance and your eyesight may not be easy to read and sometimes even if it is readable it's sort of on the edge and it's just not it's just not comfortable or you just don't like that text being quite that small and that's fine it's a, again it's a very individual thing um so it's not clear cut but it's something which some users will have a preference for higher pixel density than others. Now this video is becoming a bit of a, a guess the animal or car that Adam's going to show next. Uh, it's a nice frog this time. But um, this next factor, PWM, pulse width modulation or backlight flickering, um, this is something which has sort of got quite a lot of renewed attention because it's something that manufacturers are marketing quite heavily nowadays. Flicker free is definitely a big box that they can tick on their monitors. And the good news is that most models are flicker free. This model, for example, and the same applies to all modern BenQ LCDs. It's completely flicker free. Um, it uses DC, direct current, rather than PWM, pulse width modulation, to regulate the backlight. Um, DC dimming is a very sort of stable backlight source. It doesn't flicker. PWM, on the other hand, the backlight will constantly flicker at a certain frequency, and that frequency depends on the type of PWM cycle used. They have different duty cycles and frequencies depending on how the manufacturer has implemented it, but commonly it'll be um, 
anywhere between sort of 120 and 360 hertz uh, but you know there's a bit of variation between that but as I said most monitors nowadays they are flicker free and that's good but there are exceptions uh, this here this is a an Alienware laptop I can't remember the exact model off the top of my head I think it's an R13 but it has an OLED and OLED screen and this actually does use pulse width modulation but as with most screens that use PWM um, it's at 100 brightness at the moment and the beauty of an OLED or OLED screen is that the contrast is so high that you can actually digitally adjust the brightness. You can keep the screen at 100 brightness but use digital um, brightness adjustments. On an LCD that reduces the contrast massively but with an OLED you've got an almost infinite contrast ratio to play with anyway so you can, you can do that. You can get away with digital brightness adjustments. Um, so things look dimmer even though the, back, the brightness is set to 100. Now if I reduce the brightness, I know I was getting, going off on a tangent there but I do, I do really like the display on this, uh, this laptop. Um, so if I reduce the brightness you can start to see on the video clear sort of waves and that's flickering and that's PWM. Um, I can't remember the exact frequency of this, it's been a while since I tested it, I think it's 240 hertz. I'm not sure, um, but you can see why, uh, to my eyes, I don't see those obvious waves, and generally you don't see the obvious waves, but some users are very sensitive to flickering, and even if you don't notice the flickering itself, and even if you're not super sensitive to it, it can have a physiological effect. It can certainly fatigue your eyes uh, or accelerate the fatigue of your eyes over time. So where possible, do avoid it. And that's why I like to set this monitor to full brightness to avoid PWM. Other ways to test for PWM, you can see it quite clearly with my camera, whether it has it or not. And even if you've got just a basic smartphone or something, that usually shows PWM quite readily on a video. And it's very easy if you see that. It uh, uses PWM. If you see that, it uh, uses DC dimming, or occasionally a very high PWM frequency, but that's far less common. And you can also test it using um, Test UFO, and again, I'll link to this in the description of the video. It has a specific test for this called Blur Trail slash PWM. You can't actually see the difference on the video, it captures on the video quite strangely. But um, if you track these lines with your eye, um, and the monitor's not using PWM, they'll just look like a smooth blur. Each line um, will just sort of look like a thick line with a sort of blurred region in the middle as you track them with your eyes. But if it uses PWM, you'll actually see multiple instances of each line. It'll sort of, you might see, uh, depending on the frequency of PWM used, um, multiple instances, several instances of the line. And you'll also, if you're not quite sure what you're looking at, set the monitor brightness to 100 and then gradually dim it from there. And if you see an obvious change in the line, it generally is an indication that your screen is using PWM. There's also various other tests um, you can use. Quite old fashioned, you can use a pen um, and just sort of wave it around the screen um, like that. You can even do this with your finger if you're particularly skilled and you've got nimble fingers. Um, and you either see that, or if PWM is used, and I don't know how this will appear on the video, I can actually see the pen, um, but I can see multiple instances of the pen in this sort of arc, whereas on this screen it's sort of a smooth blurred arc, and I know it's not very clear because I'm not using a white background at the moment, um, sorry about that. Um, you can see the pen itself, it's sort of bold at the top and bottom of the arc, but in the middle of the arc there's just a sort of smooth blur. Whereas with this, you can see, or I can see to my eyes, multiple instances of the pen. If you actually do this in person, it'll be much clearer. Um, it probably doesn't look right on the video. Or if you've got one of those desk fans, it's an even easier way to do it. You can see, again, multiple instances of the blade. Um, if PWM is used, whereas if DC dimming is used, you'll just be seeing a sort of smooth area 
in between the fan blades. I'm going to be considering dithering or FRC, frame rate control, um, also known as temporal dithering more specifically. And the Legon website, which I'll link to in the description of the video, has a nice little explanation of dithering or FRC dithering on the black levels test at the bottom there. So you can see this little animation, it makes it a lot more extreme than it actually is, just so you can see it in the animation. But essentially, when a monitor uses dithering, it does that because it can't display a particular shade. Um, and instead of displaying this particular shade that it can't display, obviously because it can't display it, it'll display a very slightly lighter version of the shade and a very slightly darker version of the shade and alternate between them rapidly. And that's essentially what frame rate control dithering is, FRC dithering. The, this screen is, has a true 8-bit panel, so it doesn't use dithering. But you might actually notice some of this crawling on the Legom website because um, most people don't realize this, but the, the GPU itself actually often adds a little bit of dithering. So it's not just the monitor that's a source of dithering. It's therefore actually very difficult to get a, an, a viewing experience that is entirely free of dithering. But it is fair to say it is reduced if your monitor itself is free from FRC as well. So, why am I talking about this in a viewing comfort video? Well, I mean, I didn't really consider this even a viewing comfort factor originally on the forum post that sort of this uh, information is mainly coming from, but certainly some users do think that it is a factor. And it is, I'd say, a very minor factor, but if you notice um, shades alternating between a very slightly lighter and darker variant of a given shade, then it is really a form of, of flickering and some users who are sensitive to that might find it uncomfortable and I accept that, okay, that's fine. But I don't think most users really have to concern themselves with this. It's very different to PWM flickering where the entire backlight is changing its brightness completely from basically on or off or at least very extreme changes of brightness, you know, multiple times a second. This um, this is a very subtle brightness change compared to that. So for most users, it's really is not going to be an issue when it comes to viewing comfort. But I thought I might as well mention that because um, some users do find it an issue. So, you know, it's good to explore that here as well. Car fans rejoice! Unless you don't like Aston Martin, so I'm sorry about that. But um, anyway, the next aspect is refresh rate. And this is a bit different on CRTs and LCDs, and when you think about viewing comfort, you might think, oh, well, yes, high refresh rate, less flickering, good for the eyes. But actually, it's CRT monitors where that was an issue. CRT monitors um, are also called impulse-type displays, and that means that they flicker at a frequency matching the refresh rate of the monitor. So the refresh rate you set the monitor to, it'll flicker on and off at that frequency. And now we've got this deep into the video, it would only be natural that I would point to another article on our website. The factors affecting PC monitor responsiveness and part of what this looks at, sampling method, is kind of what I've just gone through. Um, you know, we can have impulse type displays like CRTs, but most screens um, these days are not CRTs, they are LCDs. Um, occasionally, if you're lucky, it might be an OLED, an OLED. Most of the time these are what's called sample and hold displays. Um, and that means that it doesn't matter what you set the refresh rate to, the backlight doesn't flicker at a frequency that matches that, or the screen doesn't flicker um, at a frequency that matches that. So just because you've got the monitor set to 60 hertz, it doesn't mean that the monitor is going to be flickering on and off at a frequency that matches that. The refresh rate doesn't really matter for flickering, but it is still valid for viewing comfort, because as also explored in this article, um, I should have also have mentioned, actually, this article has a, a good little um, video showing PWM artifacts, so that's another... It's not really so much to do with viewing comfort, which is why I didn't mention it, but it's a nice little video just showing you um, how PWM can cause issues to the motion clarity of a monitor. But another very important issue when it comes to motion clarity is the refresh rate of the monitor. And... 
I'm not going to repeat all of what's said in this article. Suffice to say, some users prefer high refresh rates because there's a lower perceived blur um, and they just find it more comfortable to look at. Some users find that, especially when they're gaming, um, lower refresh rate monitors give them sort of a, a feeling of motion sickness or it just makes their eyes feel uncomfortable. Um, and actually some users are so sensitive to this that even if they're just moving stuff around on the desktop, um, not necessarily playing a game or looking at that kind of thing, but just moving stuff around on the desktop or scrolling text and stuff, the difference in perceived blur that um, an increase in refresh rate makes great benefit to their viewing comfort. This is a 60 hertz monitor. You can actually overclock it to 75 hertz. I'm running it at 75 hertz now. For some users that would be fine, but for others, because of the reduced perceived blur, they would much prefer a higher refresh rate instead. Another kind of sort of subtopic, if you like, is pixel responsiveness. And of course that is explored in the article, and the responsiveness article as well. And this is also loosely related to viewing comfort, actually to some users, you know, I don't want to downplay it, to some users it's very important. Um, this is this uses a VA panel and they're known to have some issues with pixel responsiveness. There are some um, pixel responses that are slow enough to cause an obvious smearing um, sort of trailing, especially with darker shades involved in the transition. And some users do find that uncomfortable. It's not just high of refresh rate for some, but it's also tied to pixel responsiveness. And as the article explores, you don't just sort of look at screens that have one millisecond or, or whatever quoted response time, because the specified response times are utter rubbish, completely misleading, um, and very much a poor indicator of what to expect. Um, but some users would find, generally speaking, um, IPS and TN models preferable in terms of viewing comfort during motion. Some faster VA panels, um, some users, even if they're quite sensitive to the slower VA panels, they'll find the faster VA panels okay. Um, this, this model's reasonably fast for a VA model, um, for example. So, yeah. Uh, but, but as with many things, it's not something that affects all users, and actually I'd say a minority of users would find either refresh rate or pixel responsiveness a big issue for viewing comfort, unless they do do a lot of gaming and then, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, but just for general desktop tasks, um, generally speaking, for viewing comfort, it's, it's not a big issue, really. Another aspect uh, to consider is the curve of a monitor and to be honest, I put this fairly low down my list of priorities when it comes to viewing comfort and you would be restricting your choices quite a lot if you just focus on monitors which are curved. Um, this monitor I'm using at the moment is not curved, so I'm just showing you a picture of one that is, uh, just to set the scene. So this is the Samsung C34F791 and it's an ultra-wide monitor, 21 by 9 aspect ratio. And for these kind of monitors, I do feel that the curve makes sense from a viewing comfort perspective. Um, it gives you a more uniform viewing distance, the edges of the screen are brought closer to your eyes, um, your eye movement is slightly reduced, but, but manufacturers will put all of these crazy things uh, on their websites, and I don't want to single Samsung out, although I know they are sort of the main proponents of curved monitors, and some of their marketing is quite bizarre to be honest. Um, They'll say, yes, your eyes are curved, therefore your screen should be curved, without really explaining why. Uh, but essentially, I do personally find um, curved monitors, even when they're fairly steep curve, I find it to be a subtle addition. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I just find it works quite nicely. Uh, it gives a slight extra depth to the experience, but I do find them comfortable. Um, on 27-inch screens like this one, I don't really think the curve makes much of a difference either way, and for viewing comfort I really couldn't care less. Um, but some users definitely do prefer curved models in terms of viewing comfort, so do consider that. Uh, but again, it might just be that they're comparing their curved monitors to some really very old screen that, um, you know, has all sorts of different uh, issues in terms of viewing comfort anyway. Last, but by no means least, is blue light and spectral sensitivity. This can be quite a complex topic. Um, it's quite scientific, really. It um, has a lot of different sort of avenues you can explore. But I'm going to, for the purpose of this video, 
keep it fairly simple. Um, but in terms of viewing comfort, some users find some monitors a lot more comfortable than others. Some users say, oh, I use this monitor and you know it's instantly giving me eye strain. I don't know what's going on. And sometimes it can be that they just don't get on with a certain backlight. And again, to plug another one of the articles on the website, but this is very good background reading if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, your typical LED backlight with an sRGB or thereabouts colour gamut has a spectral uh, diagram which will look like this. So typical white LED spectrum. You can see a peak of blue on the chart, that's blue energy, so that's wavelengths um, that will appear as blue light to humans. Um, whereas it's a lot flatter for the rest of the spectrum. And some users find that peak of blue light to be uncomfortable. Blue light or HEVL, high energy visible light, uh, is very energetic. Um, it sort of penetrates through the, uh, the eye very efficiently and it's something which can certainly cause visual discomfort. I know there are lots of things nowadays to do with low blue light settings and that's another thing I'm going to talk about very shortly but just talking about the backlight itself. There are some monitors which um, have a much more balanced spectral profile so generally speaking the wider the colour gamut the more balanced the spectrum will be um, and indeed it's those strong peaks of energy for blue, green and red that can actually create such a wide colour gamut. So the more balanced spectrum, some users just find that a lot more comfortable. And for a given brightness, the level of blue light they're exposed to will actually be reduced um, because the brightness is not just from the blue but also from the other areas of the spectrum. Um, quantum dots, a lot of models these days promote quantum dots. You have to remember that they do use blue diodes, blue LEDs, um, but the quantum dot layer itself does allow the screen to emit um, much more pure red and green light. Um, that's what the quantum dots do in most LCDs that have them these days. And that will produce a wide colour gamut, not necessarily this wide, uh, but certainly well beyond sRGB and that gives you a more balanced spectral profile again and some users do find this more comfortable. So if you are stuck with a monitor with a standard sRGB colour gamut or even if you are using a model with a wider colour gamut and you do find this blue light uncomfortable you can reduce it um, simply by reducing the blue colour channel or some Monitors have low blue light settings. This one, again, a lovely example for this, has very easily accessible low blue light settings. This strongest on BenQ monitors being reading mode. And this gives a very warm look to the image. You could probably even see on the video that there was a distinct change in the colour tone. And what that'll do is that that really decreases the blue light output significantly. And I should mention as well the, the brightness that you've got the monitor set to is also very important in terms of how much blue light it's emitting, but how much light it's emitting full stop really. Part of that is of course blue. Uh, some, use, uh, some, sorry, some models have a slightly shifted wavelength and um, which is slightly less energetic for the blue light so they, they shift the peak slightly. It's not always, this isn't always an advertised feature just some backlights have a different blue point so to speak and some users will find that again more comfortable. Now in terms of blue light and blue light settings really I'm just talking about viewing comfort in this video but for me personally a large part of that comes when I'm using a monitor in the evening. In the daytime I don't find blue light uncomfortable and in fact it's actually perfectly natural to be exposed to blue light in the daytime. It is a signal which keeps the body alert um, you're exposed to a lot of blue light and a lot more than you'd actually be exposed to from a monitor if you just step outside, especially on a bright day like today. Um, you'd be exposed to a lot more blue light then and that's fine, it keeps your body awake. It's an important signal. But in the evening you don't necessarily want that or just before bed you don't want your body to be in this energetic state and it does disrupt sleep and it affects your sleep hormones 
And this is something I sort of bang on about in my reviews quite a lot because it is important and it's something that I have a lot of personal experience with. So low blue light settings um, are really an easy way to reduce the blue light output from the monitor and I do personally use them wherever I can in the evening. There's also a little application called Flux or F-Lux uh, which doesn't affect the monitor directly but adjusts the blue light um, by adjusting what the GPU outputs. Personally I prefer to do things on the hardware side where possible so use low blue light settings or just the blue color channels but if you really find that a faff, um, just you know, just uh, inconvenient, then you can use flux instead. Just, and there are some other alternatives which do a similar thing. But basically, when it's the evening, it'll give you a warmer image. It'll reduce the blue light output from your monitor, and that can aid a restful night's sleep. To wrap up, then everybody's eyes are different. Um, it's not always a clear-cut thing what particular factors one individual will find important when it comes to viewing comfort on a monitor. But certainly this, this video has explored some of the things that I would look out for. Some of these will be more important to some users than, than other things. Also be aware not just of the monitor itself but your ambient lighting because keeping that in check is important as well. And I know there'll be plenty of, of factors which I haven't considered here, which you might be thinking, oh well, why, why wasn't this mentioned? Um, but that's just because I don't personally find them particularly important. Uh, that doesn't mean that some users wouldn't find them important. So, you know, feel free in the comments section to mention some of these or share your own experiences with viewing comfort as well. Um, in terms of recommending specific models, I'm not going to do it on this video because monitor technology does move on. And I don't want this video to go out of date just because of uh, some specific models that I've mentioned um, which are sort of no longer relevant. But the website does have a recommendations section and this is always kept up to date with various models. And these aren't, you know, specifically models which are good in terms of viewing comfort. But as it, does, as it happens, I do tend to list monitors. Um, well, all of the monitors I list will be flicker free for one thing but they tend to have low blue light settings as well, easily accessible low blue light settings. Not always, but more often than not. Um, they also tend to have fairly light matte anti-glare screen surfaces, or in some cases I might list some with glossy screen surfaces, but I don't tend to recommend a monitor if they have grainy matte screen surfaces. Some of them have high refresh rates as well, uh, quite a few of them do actually. So there's quite a lot of boxes ticked for some of these um, in terms of viewing comfort. But hopefully this video has given you some sort of ideas of, of what to uh, keep in mind when it comes to choosing a monitor based on viewing comfort. Again, be, be sure to check out the uh, articles that I've linked to. Finally, there is um, a section of the website called Support Us, and it really does what it says on the tin. It just gives you information about... Um, how you can support the work that we do on the website and on YouTube, and that's very much appreciated.